reading from the book of Deuteronomy. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who pre presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded, the prophet to speak that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care, but, but take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family, and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore if food is at a, therefore food is a I'm sorry, therefore if food is a cause of their failing, I will let, never eat meat, so that I may not cause the one of them to fail. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. She cried if you were able. you can read from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as, as the scribes. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, 
What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The true gospel of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord, 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 Lord. Lord. Okay, be seated, please. All right. <clears throat> First of all, let me explain that um, if Gavin will sh- let me have him for a second. Come on. We have a new addition to the uh, to the church family here. And this is what's his name? <laughs> Dexter. Dexter. <laughs> this is Dexter. Hi, Dexter. Hi, Dexter. Say hi to the world, buddy. It's your debut. Mm-hmm. Um, Dexter and Munchkin are um, learning to get along, and Bella and Dexter are learning not to fight and bark at each other. So there's been some noises and some things, and Munchkin's all kinds of confused and upset. So he's out there. They're out here with us today for the service, okay? And, and we have a special guest coming in this week. Say hello, everybody. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. How you doing? I'm a Dan. All righty, then. You're quite all right, Dan. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Okay, so we got Dexter here. And he's, he's joined our family. He's a miniature. No, he's a he's a toy. No, he's not a toy. He's a toy. He's a toy. <laughs> red nosed applehead chihuahua. A toy red nosed applehead chihuahua. Okay. Right. So everybody say hello. This is this is Dexter. And he's gonna be around for a while. So all of you out there, so you know who he is. We got Dexter and Munchkin and Bella now. Can you cute? Mm-hmm. Okay, got yeah. it. Back to you, bud. <laughs> if we were to personally walk into church this afternoon, if Jesus were personally to walk into church this afternoon, what would it be like? We all have our stereotypical opinions of what it would be like. Some think we'd feel an awesome, an awesome peace. Well, that'd be nice. Others think a heavenly love would pervade. Others, a feeling of tenderness and compassion. In today's text, Jesus shows up for Sabbath worship, and it was way different than anyone expected. Before we launch into our text, let's get our bearings with a little background this afternoon. In the very first verse of the Gospel of Mark, John tells us his theme. He says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Everything in Mark's book was written to convince us that Jesus is the Son of God. Each section of chapter 1 we've looked at so far was written to reinforce this truth. The fact that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah in verses 2 through 3. The baptism of Jesus wherein God the Father gave his verbal approval of Jesus and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove to anoint Jesus for service. How he overcame Satan in that titanic 40 days of temptation in the wilderness and finally in his immediate success in his preaching and his remarkable attraction, such that when he called believers to be his apostles, they immediately responded. All of these sound like someone who is not your average run-of-the-mill rabbi. No. Jesus, Jesus is unique. <laughs> Jesus is unique. The very Son of God, in fact. Now, in verse 21 to 35, Mark records a single day in the ministry of Jesus. In a single 24-hour period, Jesus demonstrates that he was the Son of God by his extraordinary authority. Now that's the key word in verses 21 through 35, authority. In this passage, and indeed in his whole life, Jesus exercised the type of authority reserved only for God himself. That's the point Mark tries to convey. The word authority is found ten times in Mark. The Greek word Exosia, exosia, has several shades of meaning, but I can sum up all the language dictionaries by saying that it means inherent ability and power and the resultant right to exercise that power. That'll be on the test. Mm-hmm. In verses 21 through 35, the subjects of today's and next week's sermons, we will see how Jesus suddenly and beyond anyone's expectations assumes power possible only to God and rights and prerogatives reserved only for God, thereby proving that he is, indeed, the Son of God. Now, 
I want you to note first that Jesus taught with authority. Verses 21 through 22. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teachings, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. A faithful follower of God, Jesus attended the synagogue on the Sabbath in Capernaum, the hub of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. The temple was the place of worship and sacrifice. The synagogue was a place of teaching and instruction. There was only one temple in Jerusalem. But wherever there were at least ten families, it was a rule of Judaism that a synagogue must be established. Therefore, the synagogue was by far the more influential and the logical place for Jesus to begin to establish his divine authority. When he entered the synagogue, Jesus began to teach. Mark doesn't bother to tell us of what Jesus taught. He only tells us that the response to his teachings, he said, they were astonished at his teachings. That is a common response of people who first read the Gospels with an open mind. The, the teachings of Jesus truly are remarkable. Even great atheists marvel at Jesus' teachings. In his book, Reflections on the Psalms, C.S. Lewis wrote, In Jesus' teaching there is no profession. He wrote no book. We have only reported sayings, most of them uttered in answers to questions, shaped in some degree by their context. He preaches, but he does not lecture. He used paradox, proverb, proverb exaggeration, parable, irony, even. I mean, no, no irreverence. I mean no irreverence by this. The wisecrack. His teaching cannot be grasped by the intellect alone. Why were Jesus' teachings so different? Well, because everyone else's teachings were, were taught with something less than authority. They were, they, they were taught with the personal authority that Jesus had from God. He was God. The scribes who were largely Pharisees, and as Kent Hughes put it, they were in bondage to quotation marks. They loved to quote the authorities. Rabbi Hillel says, but on the other hand, Gamaliel says, then there is Rabbi Eleazar's testimony ad nauseum. I can't say all those words, but you get the point. Yeah. It was secondhand theology, secondhand. Their teachings descended into convoluted, petty, legalistic dis distinctions that were boring, with no spontaneity and no joy. But Jesus was totally different. When he spoke, he spoke as if he needed no authority beyond himself, because he was the authority. He spoke with utter independence, citing no experts. He spoke with the finality of the voice of God. Well, because <laughs> he was God. When Mark says they were astonished, that does not necessarily mean they all liked it. They were astonished because his teachings shocked them. Both his style and content were just so radically different. It was not the norm. It, it rattled them. Jesus was never regarded as a mere moral teacher did not produce that effect on any of the people who actually met him. He produced mainly three effects. Hatred, terror, and adoration. There was not, there was not trace of people expressing mild admiration. Why was this? Because Jesus didn't just teach to educate, but to call people to decision. Call all people to his kingdom. And a kingdom implies a king, a ruler, a master. And that king is Jesus. <clears throat> Some people simply will not bend the knee to Jesus and therefore hate him and everything about him. Some run in terror at surrendering their lives to Jesus, not realizing that only in Jesus is their eternal life and an abundant life on this earth. But some people hear Jesus' words and respond in faith and obedience and experience the joy of knowing him and experiencing his blessings. And next, in verses 22 through 27, Jesus exercised authority over the powers of darkness. Now, if you've ever been to some of the churches in the hills and hollers in rural USA, you can see some strange things. Once a part of a congregation was raising support as missionaries being invited to a, a week-long missions conference at a church way back in the Smoky Mountains of Western North Carolina. For the moment they got there, it was weird, but their mission board had trained them that no matter what the situation, just go with the flow. 
not so sure about that one, but okay. The mission, the mission to speak with that week was one of those screaming preachers. He was a wild man, one time running down the aisle, screaming like a banshee, going out the entrance of the church, still screaming, and coming around to the side entrance, still screaming, to the top of his lungs, and running up to the pulpit again, still screaming to the top of his lungs. I don't think I could do that today. <laughs> Over right. Okay. Huh? Next week. Oh, let's not. Okay. Try to get this place back. Keep it. <clears throat> Overall, the congregation was pretty calm up to that point. With only your normal amens here and there, you get, you get in some you know, southern churches. Then suddenly, without warning, the lady, the lady right behind a couple of the missionary seats jumped up and let out a holler that would raise the dead. When that happened, Susan, one of the missionaries who was kind of jumpy by nature anyway, literally jumped out of her seat a foot high. And her husband was not solidly planted in his seat, in seat either. It scared him so much. That ain't nothing compared with that with what happened when Jesus went to church. Already people are perplexed and astonished with Jesus' teaching and the authority with which he taught it, as if he were the authority in himself. But what happened next would make your hair curl, literally. Look at verses 23 through 27. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Suddenly, during Jesus' teaching, a man with an unclean spirit, another word for a demon, caused disturbance in the congregation. Now, can you imagine what would happen if that happened in our service? It would kind of freak you out, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure it hasn't happened in our services. <laughs> the demon-possessed man was so totally controlled by the demon that he could not stand to listen to Jesus' teaching. Now notice that he was in the synagogue. He was in a place of spiritual learning and religious activities. His religious and cultural ties to Judaism had done him no good. He was absolutely helpless. The congregation there that day was only dimly starting to process his teacher who taught with such compelling authority. And suddenly the demon speaks through the voice of the man and says, let us alone. What have, you to, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Several of the commentaries I consulted said that the phrase, have you come to destroy us, is not really a question. Rather, it was an accusation. You have, you have to destroy us. But the congregation did not understand who Jesus was. There was no doubt in the mind of the demon. In several demonic encounters in Mark, the demons know instantly who Jesus is. They identify him as the Holy One of God. In this verse, the Son of God, in chapter 3, verse 11, and the, and the Son of the Most High God, in chapter 11, verse 7. Demons knew exactly who he was. They knew, among other things he had set out to do, he would most certainly utterly destroy them in time. This is another piece of evidence that Mark provides to show that Jesus was the Son of God. Yet, Despite hearing these things with their own ears, the people could not process it. Now, demon possession was not unknown to the ancient world. There were many exorcists who claimed to be able to cast out demons. The ordinary Jewish and pagan exorcists used elaborate incantations and spells and magical rites. Whether they really had any control of demons is debatable because they were, they were trafficking in the very arts controlled by demons. The so-called exorcisms were known to go on for hours or days to quite quieten a demon's influence, at least for a while. Not so with Jesus. With one command of clear, simple, brief authority, Jesus says only seven words. Be quiet and come out of him. And instantly the demon obeys and comes out of the man in a horrible demonic frenzy and loud convulsive scream. And then, just like that, he was perfectly whole and free from demon's power. No one had ever seen anything like this before. 
What power and authority? The power was not in a spell, a formula, an incantation, or an elaborate rite. The power was in Jesus himself. The reaction of the congregation was sheer amazement. And again, the word authority comes up in verse 27 as they say, They debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. The effect of this kind of power and authority was electrifying. They began to realize that Jesus was not some simple, wandering religious rabbi. He was a power to be reckoned with. Later, Jesus began to claim rights and prerogatives reserved only for God. Their debate and bewilderment would only become more pronounced. Eventually, his claims to divine right and prerogatives would lead to his crucifixion by his enemies. Now, one little side note. Did you notice how Jesus told the demon to be quiet? He wasn't just trying to diffuse the situation before an already terrified congregation. Later in, in verse 34, we're told that Jesus cast out many demons, and the verse continues, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And in chapter 3, verse 11 through 12, Mark records, and whenever unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known, not to make him known. And isn't that kind of odd? Why would Jesus forbid them to reveal who he was? Well, sorry. You're gonna have to wait till we get to those verses. I'm gonna leave you hanging on, on this one this afternoon. <laughs> Alright, notice last in verse 28 that the news of Jesus' power and authority spread everywhere. And immediately his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. News of Jesus' power and authority spread like wildfire. Realistically speaking, could you expect any different response? Following such an eventful Sabbath at the synagogue, Jesus' fame was bound to spread throughout all of Galilee, and then all of Judea, and then ultimately north, south, east, and west. The people were able to remain quiet about the wonder they had witnessed. And every day, more incredible things would happen, which only fed the fame of this miracle worker. People had to share it with everyone they met. Here's an idea. They couldn't hold it in. These are remarkable events. But what do they mean to us personally? First, never forget the reality of the demonic world. Never forget the reality of the demonic world. There are evil things that happen in this world that cannot just be explained by sinful human nature. Satan is real. And he has a mobilized army to carry out his plan to kill, steal, and destroy. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly realms. But Jesus defeated the devil at the cross, and we already know the final outcome. We win. Although the destruction of satanic forces awaits the final judgment, Jesus dealt its death blow on the cross. In 1 John chapter, or 1 John chapter 4 verse 4, comforts us with these words. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, I have good news for you. Christians cannot be demon-possessed. Hallelujah. Amen. When you are born into God's family by faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit indwells in you. The Holy Spirit will not coexist with the demon. However, though demons cannot possess a Christian, when we surrender to sin in our lives, we can fall under the influential influence of Satan and his demon world. When that happens, we should be quick to confess our sins and return to fellowship with God. The second thing I want you to do is challenge you today to surrender. Surrender to Jesus Christ's authority. Each of the four Gospels have different main emphasis. But one thing is clear from all of them. Jesus has the authority to direct and order your life. He has the right to tell you what to do. The kingdom of God is not a democracy. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Lord, and he has the right to rule your life. Be a disciple of Jesus by being obedient to your kingdom. Last, I want you to realize that God can save anybody. This man was under the influence of demons, which happens only when people willingly surrender themselves to the direct influence of Satan. 
this hopeless manhood rolled in the dust and despair before that horror-stricken congregation rose to wholeness, joy, peace, and deliverance. Goosebumps. Listen, there's, a, there's hope for the worst of us. You may have the hardest heart of anyone on this planet. They may seem to be impenetrable, irredeemable, hopeless, impossible. I have good news for you. Jesus is willing and ready to change your life. If you will let him. Will you? You recognize your sinfulness before God. You might be a good person in your own eyes. This man was in the synagogue doing religious stuff. But he was lost and controlled by Satan. He had religion. But his connection to God had been severed. Listen. Jesus has come to church this afternoon. You must not miss him. If God is dealing with you now, he might not continue to. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. Don't put off until tomorrow what you should do today. And how do you know what you should do today? Pray. Let's see if I make this work. Alexa. Hi. What is the definition of prayer? Prayer is not a monologue. It is a conversation between you and God. So, say what you have to say, then shut up and listen. God has something to say to you. Please catch it. Prayer is not a monologue. It is a conversation between you and God. So, say what you have to say, then shut up and listen. Right? Right. Alexa, who taught you that? Uncle Alexa, who taught you that? As if you have to ask, Bishop Mark taught me this and so much more. Amen. Mm -hmm.